Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the next episode of this series of webinars. Today, it's a bit different. It's a little bit special with all the, the attentions on John. John McCaffrey, who's our tax wizard from Alexander and Co. So good morning, John. Good morning, Dan. How are you doing? You OK? I'm very well, thank you. Good, good. So as you all know, normally it's myself, um, the wizard John, and then Roger um, on these webinars. Obviously, today's a little bit different, so Rog is unable to attend today. He's currently signing on the Job Centre. Um, <laughs> no, jokingly, um, obviously, he parted ways with OSB beginning of September now, so due to that, he's not able to attend this webinar, but not to fear. There's still going to be lots of content, lots of amazing content, and Roger will be back joining us for our Christmas special on the 15th of December, so keep an eye out for that after this. Um, I'll be back to the three amigos. But I think it's fair to say that we've got a lot to speak um, around today. A lot's happened in the market again um, since the last webinar two months ago, which is just relentless at the moment and hard to keep up. And I know everybody's really busy. We're all firefighting. But the most important thing is we're all in it together. We're in the trenches with you guys. Any questions you've got in relation to the current market, um, tax related questions then please do fire away because the usual format for these webinars is there's no set agenda we answer your questions and have a discussion between ourselves so we'll make it as informative as possible please do engage and ask as many questions as you like and we'll try and get through as many of them as possible but John um, how's it been for the past couple of months in terms of business levels and obviously we'll discuss the changes in a second but how yeah. you found I suppose the summer really and and coming into um, it, it's, it's not stopped Dan. it has been relentless in terms of business levels and increasing so um there's a lot of talk almost didn't get out of bed yesterday nuclear war recession and angela lansbury died so i was kind of like not a good day <laughs> um but following on from that it was um yeah the the the, the, the and the talk of recession that the, the the underlying figures that professional services are holding up the economy at the moment in terms of there's a lot of growth um, because there is a lot of change and a lot more people are needing advice out there at the moment. So genuinely, genuinely nuts in the world of tax right now for more than one reason. Yeah, yeah, which again we'll discuss um, in a second, but that's it. And I think after speaking to you over the past couple of weeks, more and more people are having to, to rely on yourself and people like yourselves to provide that, that sound advice because there's lots of whispers at the moment um, with, I suppose, landlords offloading properties, yep. which we'll, we'll touch on uh, moving forward. But just to give you an overview of what we're seeing at the moment, obviously, uh, I mean, from our stance, from Crystal's stance, we're, we're busier than ever at the moment with new business. I think that's purely... One, because of the hard work that we do and the, the brand that we're building, but most importantly, it's the fact that, again, as I mentioned, we're in the trenches with brokers and with the sourcing systems not being ultimately accurate at the moment or as accurate as, as they can be or the fact that people are um, firefighting with the cases that are currently in pipeline. So we are seeing an influx in new business, um, which kind of answers the question in terms of one of the questions that we've had pre-asked. Now, the main one is, can you see a crash coming or will there be a crash within property, the property market and values? Um, obviously all the papers are saying there's doom and gloom, there's between 10 and 30% drop off and um, the market is gonna crash. But I mean, my personal opinion, again, purely for me is, there's not gonna be a crash, it's just gonna be a correction. And that's all it is. Over the past couple of years, you've had lots going on. Obviously you've had the stamp duty, um, which really helped the market and made it buoyant. Um, but we've got to look at it, the fact that they can't get houses up quick enough at the moment, stocks, still at an all-time low as much as it has slowed down as such i think the market the correct way of saying it is the market's going to correct itself but i don't believe there's going to be a crash certainly to not all the the doom and gloom is what the papers are saying but as we know the newspapers the well bad press sells doesn't it it does it does i have to say one of the worst things that happened to this country is 24-hour media because yeah. everybody is trying to grab headlines that's and, it we look at and that part of that is is there a crash i agree with you now there's a housing shortage still. And what is coming to bite, and it's something we've been talking about for the last couple of years, as interest rates rise, the um, restriction on the deduction of interest is now starting to hurt a number of unincorporated landlords. So previously, they might have been able to take the pain. 
now the, you, you're finding some landlords entering that territory whereby actually once you factor in the lack of tax deduction, they're paying more tax than they're making profit. Mm -hmm. No, exactly that. Exactly that. So again, um, that's, that's on the, the agenda for the conversations today. But let's discuss the current changes. Obviously, we've had a, a mini budget, essentially. Liz Truss has had a great honeymoon period. Um, I think we'll all agree. Bloody hell, Boris Johnson will be sat there laughing now. Um, but it has definitely been a turbulent couple of weeks. Things are starting to settle down. From our side of things, more and more lenders are coming back to the market with these fixed rate products. Um, which more and more clients are, are waiting for. But what have been the biggest changes in your world from a, a tax point of view with the, the budgets and the recent changes? Right, so there's been a lot of changes and a few U-turns. So okay. as it stands, the, the mini budget was introduced, but it's not being voted on by Parliament till spring. So a number of changes have been announced and we expect them to stick but it's not necessarily going to be the case. So very briefly, the uh, top rate of tax disappeared in that 45% tax <laughs> threshold disappeared. Uh, and that came back a couple of days later. Um, what appears to have stuck though, is that um, the national insurance uh, rise looks to have been canceled and will be implemented from pay packets in November. Yeah. The corporation tax intended rise from April 23 has been reversed. So that would have taken up um, tax on profits in companies. Um, it, it's a bit weird the way you work it out. Companies earning less than 50 grand wouldn't have affected. So they'd have still been on 19%. Companies earning more than 250 grand profits would have been on a straight line of 25%. And then there's the, most companies falling between 50 and 250 grand um, would have been on a sliding scale, but the way the rules worked is that bit of profit would have been taxed at 26.5%. Um, that's all gone. And so uh, companies are now going to be taxed on a straight line of 19%. So um, landlords holding company, properties in companies will benefit from that. Mm -hmm. um, the other changes that were introduced in the mini budget were, um, I'm, I'm sure everybody's aware of these because they were highly touted, um, the stamp duty. So the rate at which all properties now attract stamp duty, or residential properties anyway, is now 250,000. Yep, rather than 125,000. Yep. Um, and first time buyers relief. So the amount on which first time buyers now get exemption, I think has moved up to, if I can find it, because I can't remember all the facts off the top of my head. Is it 450? 450, might be 425, might be 425. Yeah, yeah, no, there's, there's definitely been a yeah. few changes, but yeah, no, it is, it is within that realm, I believe it's 450, or it could, again, it could be 425, yeah. um, but it's certainly higher, but realistically, is that going to, Who's that going to use? To so, if you've got, um, and there's a little bit there, Dan. If you've got landlords who are feeling the pain, there has been a move to certain landlords offloading properties. Yeah, you've got certain first time buyers, but there hasn't yet been a collapse in property prices. So, the accessibility of properties and affordability of properties hasn't changed a great deal. Um, we're in a technical recession in that we are 0.2 decline rather than a drop in productivity. Um, unemployment at its lowest level since 1974. Mm -hmm. But wages haven't increased accordingly. They've gone up about 6% rather than 10%. Um, it's a bit of a holding period. There is a cost of living crisis coming. Yeah. But apparently wholesale gas prices are set to plummet. So it may be a little bit rough. I don't think it's going to be terrible. I think people holding the nerves, holding the nerve, um, should be all right. And landlords should be all right because the, the, there is still a need for rental properties out there. That's it. That's it. Again, if you look at the stock from a, a rental point of view, um, certainly when speaking to local estate agents, there's actually waiting lists for people to to actually find these properties and get into this accommodation. So 
Yeah, I, I can see the, the being a crash. I mean, what, what we're forgetting is when we're comparing it to the likes of 2008 in terms of yeah. lenders' positions and what happened to the market, if we look at where we sit currently, from mm-hmm. a lender's point of view, the lenders are very liquid. Um, and that's what we have to keep reminding ourselves, clients and um, introducers and such, because lenders are very liquid and it's completely different to 2008. But ultimately, if you're looking at the five-year bond market as to where that currently sits on the back of, obviously, the, the mini budget, so to speak, and everything else going on in the world, it's a lot higher than it has been. And we remember, we've got to remind ourselves again that from 2008 up until now, we've had it very good. It's not been a normal market. I mean, look at look at yourself, obviously, when you had a, a mortgage um, back then, which I assume you will have done, the rate would have been far higher than what you're currently on now, I would assume. So we've had it too good for too long. Um, with rates at kind of, what, 2%, 3%? somewhere like that. Whereas if you look prior, maybe 20 years ago, you might've been on 10, 15% interest rate and that was the norm. So I think, again, from that point of view, it's the market correcting itself. Um, base rates obviously being that low where it's normally gonna sit around what, between two and 4%, so to speak, but it has been known to be, to be far higher than that. And it's just, it's going back to normal market. The downside of it is obviously your property values, they've risen substantially um, in comparison to, to wages. Obviously, if you look at from an income point of view, wages haven't really haven't increased in line with what the properties have where again if you're going back to PDL when um my parents have bought their first property wages and house prices were a lot more in line so but it's all relative but from a lender's point of view putting the the rates up if you give me 10 pounds and i give you seven pounds back would you be happy with that you wouldn't no. is that an effective business model no it's not yep. so again it's just about correcting themselves waiting to see where the market settles. Obviously, there's been a lot of shock within the industry and the sectors um, over the coming over the past weeks, but hopefully they'll settle down um, and we'll get to a more normal level. Um, but I think certainly from our point of view at the moment, it's one of the easiest sells ever because rates are going to continue to go up over the coming months um, and years. So if a client wants to secure the best deal now, or at least start the process, then now is the, the right time. So there's been obviously some more changes within your sector um there's been loads but one of the the biggest one is there's been a change in revenue guidance so this relates to property businesses that include commercial property um so can you just elaborate on that what's changed um hope people are sitting comfortably but this is quite techy but it's really interesting um so due to technical wording of the legislation around the additional rate of stamp duty so the extra three percent and in August, the, the revenue very quietly changed the guidance on a particular um, area of this. So if you are an unincorporated landlord um, or a partnership, and you are looking to incorporate your business, right? And the majority of your property is residential, you would generally expect to pay the additional 3% on transferring to the company. Now, due to the wording of the legislation, if your incorporation includes commercial property that isn't immaterial and is not included simply to take advantage of what I'm about to tell you. So say, for example, you incorporate a set of flats above shops, um, or you do actually own commercial property as part of your setup. Yeah. Um, if you incorporate, make a multiple dwellings relief claim. And just as a bit of a reminder, that is where you've got the same seller and vendor, sorry, same seller and purchaser, and you are selling multiple properties for stamp duty purposes, you can make a multiple dwellings relief claim, which is basically you pay stamp duty on the average price of each property rather than the collective whole. In those circumstances, the revenue have agreed that the 3% stamp duty increase doesn't apply, which can be huge. Absolutely, yeah. Yep. So I've just done a transaction whereby um, the guy in question had actually done that, mainly residential uh, property, but he owned within that two commercial units as part of the flat. 
And as a result, he saves something like 20, 30,000 pounds of stamp duty. That's phenomenal. That is phenomenal. And again, that's not something that I would have been made aware of. And I suppose normal um, tax savvy, or not tax savvy um, advisors wouldn't have been because again- no, They very quietly changed the guidance because obviously they don't want too many people to know about it. No, and when you do stamp duty returns, they're basically going to say, they're going to say when they disagree, but they're not going to say when they're about to hand money back. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's a, it's a good little nugget back. And there's, there's quite a few people that will hold um, that commercial element within their portfolio. So it's yeah. definitely a, a conversation starter. And over the past couple of months, and certainly in the past couple of weeks, would you say you've seen an, up, an uplift in conversations with landlords that are looking to now incorporate? Have left Absolutely. Over? Absolutely. As, as I alluded to before, um, the, the, the restriction on the interested option, um, and so that's basically now what's happening is, um, and again, I'll just go over it. You are, you get your rental income, you are taxed on it. Um, so if you've got hundred grand of rental income, you pay your tax on it. And then you get 20% of the interest as a deduction against the tax. Okay. Mm -hmm. So as your interest cost increases, you're laying out more money, but you're getting less overall tax relief. So it's eating more and more into your profits. So um, there are definitely conversations being had with landlords who are most definitely looking to um, incorporate because companies don't have that interest restriction on them at the moment. Yeah. And there's no intent, don't want to say at the moment, it doesn't appear that they ever will. Well, the, I mean, from our point of view, how can the, I suppose, if how can, there's always a way, um, segment and particularly target that particular sector uh, from that point of view. But again, there's always a, away with HMRC isn't as we as we very well know so yeah and I think I'm guessing now the answer to this question would be as time moves on and rates get higher yeah. um, and you tax on income so to speak etc it's going to be more beneficial than ever yeah. to, uh, and benefit more people than ever to incorporate than it would be to just leave them alone still I would still say Dan you need to look at the individual circumstances Mm -hmm. well, yes, more people are now being pushed into the circumstance whereby incorporation is looking to be a more viable option for them. Right. Okay. Amazing. Amazing. Perfect. Thank you for that. Right. So we just had um, a live question come in from an anonymous attendee. Thank you very much for this. So this is obviously aimed at you, John, as everything is. Um, I have a client who bought a let to buy property paying additional stamp duty on the purchase. Now he wishes to transfer the let property to the limited company. Two things here. So one, can he claim the additional tax he paid for the new property um, back? And when he transfers the let property to limited company, does he have to pay additional stamp duty? So I suppose there's two questions in there. Can he claim the money back from the purchase? I suppose that's going to depend on how long ago it was purchased. Oh well, no, um, so if he's bought a let to buy, is this a first property? I'm guessing, what I would assume from this, and if you want to give us a bit more context on it, but I'm guessing that he owned a property. Yeah. He's purchased a, a new property, which is going to be more expensive, um, but the existing residential has just been turned into a buy-to-let property, meaning he's paying the additional stamp on the purchase. So can he claim that back if he were to move it to a limited company? And would he pay additional stamp duty on the property in the limited company? Right. So, if that's the case, um, your chap had main home, I assume, Guess bought the so. second one and retained the first one. So, paid the additional rate stamp duty on the second property. If the transfer of the first property is to a limited company, within three years of the purchase of the second property, yes, they should be able to reclaim the additional rate stamp duty if the second property is their main residence. And yes, the company will pay additional rate stamp duty on the purchase of the first property. So it's a question of which is the cheaper property and is it therefore worthwhile to 
transfer the first property to the company um, and recover the tax on the second property. Yeah. No, absolutely. And we do we discuss this quite a bit on these webinars, don't we? Because it's a different scenario and different solution, which some people do think about and do consider. But again, if you've got a client who, similar to um, what my sister did, she owned a, bought her first property. It was just a little um, three-bed semi, nothing special. It bought it for £100,000. But because of the memories that she'd made there, um, she was lucky enough when she purchased her new property, which I think was the £300,000, yeah. she wanted to retain it. And then at that point, Rog obviously mentioned around moving the property, the existing one, to the limited company. Um, obviously not having to pay the increased stamp duty on the, the purchase of the new residential, but having to pay the increased stamp on the purchase when moving it to the limited company. Yep. Again, it's a scenario that a lot of people overlook, um, but it could certainly save the clients thousands. Um, in that particular situation, as John mentioned, yes, you can potentially look to, to reclaim that back within the three-year period, but obviously you're going to pay the increased stamp on the transaction, moving it to the limited company. So obviously, again, it is it is a sale and purchase. So it doesn't work in every situation, but it's certainly worth discussing with your clients if it's an option for them to, to retain this property, which a lot do want to do. Yeah. Um, it certainly may be tax efficient to move it across to the limited company from an income point of view and also um, a stamp point of view. So again, it's definitely worth comparing, keeping it in the individual names versus um, limited company. And again, obviously, I'm guessing it could well be beneficial, um, depending on the client's long-term plans from a, a portfolio point of view. Absolutely, absolutely. Generally, in those circumstances, you, you, your second, if your second property is worth substantially more than your first, it's generally beneficial to do it. Um, if there's not a lot in it, then you need to factor the costs of running the company, the transferring of the property to the company, all that good fun stuff. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly that. Exactly that, but it's certainly worth um, comparing. And again, if it's something that you want someone like John to to have a look at and have a full review of the client, then obviously he's more than happy to do so. But thank you very much for that question. John, there's another one. Um, now, obviously, holiday lets at the moment. They haven't kind of let up over the past couple of years. More and more people are buying them in the likes of Wales, um, yeah. Cornwall, that sort of area. Now, if an individual was wanting to use the property personally. Mm -hmm. One, I suppose there's a few parts to this question. Um, and again, we've had that in from the pre-asked questions. Would they be able to use it from a personal point of view? Yeah. And if so, now disregarding what lenders say, et cetera, but from a tax yeah. point of view, um, let's say it's bought cash, is there any tax implications for them using it on a personal level? And if yeah. so, is that if it's in individual names, limited company names, or does it not matter if they're a shareholder, director? It, it does matter. So it depends, it very much depends how they hold it down. Um, okay. If you are an individual holding a furnished holiday let, your use of that property is basically a reduction in your profits. It doesn't really matter. Um, you've not let it out. It depends how much you use it for. But basically, you're only taxed on the income you receive as a sole trader. Yep. All right. Yep. In a company, it gets a whole lot more complicated, right? Because the property at that point doesn't belong to the individual. It belongs to the company. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if the company allows the shareholder director to use the property rent free, yeah, that rent or that value of that use is a taxable benefit in kind. Right. Right. Okay. So it's basically on the individual is treated as a salary payment on which they will owe income tax and the company has to make an employer's national insurance contribution depending on the size of the value. Okay. So you, yeah, you're dead right. You need to be really careful around that. So the fact that you're a shareholder or director actually makes it worse right. rather than and it's not just you, it's any family member as well. So you would suffer the benefit in kind if you allow extended family members to utilise the property free of charge. Okay, that's interesting. So, well, there's no right or wrong way, is there? Because obviously you're going to be taxed on the income if it's in your individual name. Yeah. 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 But obviously you don't have the, the benefit in kind and the taxation and the national insurance contribution. Uh, the, the other thing some people do is actually... Um, 
So for a lot of reasons, things like the, there are certain structures around inheritance tax um, and certain property planning structures that so capital values protected and generally the rent is quite high um, certain individuals will pay rent. So if you um, are an owner, there is nothing to prevent you utilizing company assets on arm's length terms. Okay. So if you pay the rent to the company, that, that doesn't give rise to an issue particularly. Right. Okay. Yeah. And that's yeah. different from general residential properties, right? So that's, that's specific to holiday lets. If it's a general residential property and the owner of the company rents out the property to themselves or to a family member, yeah? Um, there's a there's a tax charge on properties over half a million quid a year known as the annual tax on envelope dwellings. Okay. And rental, the, one of the one of the exclusions from that charge is it's a rental business. But that falls foul if the renters are family members. Right. <laughs> Pow. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. Again, it, it's all useful information because it's certainly stuff that um, when we're having conversations with brokers and clients, so to speak, that yeah. People are looking to do more holiday lets because obviously they see it as a potential benefit to them if if for whatever reason one, two, three, four weeks of the year they want to use it themselves. And it's just looking at wrapping it up in that right way. And obviously we're not tax advisors at, at Crystal. I'm certainly not a tax advisor. So there's a bit of a compliance bit there. Um there's been but, another development recently that may be of interest. Okay. Um it's a little bit niche, but um, I imagine, I don't know if the broker's similar to me, it's kind of like you get your client's life stories when they're talking to you about um, various bits and pieces. Um, it relates to divorce and assets. So at the moment, if you are a divorcing couple, you have to transfer assets during the year of separation for them to be free of capital gains tax. Yeah. So if you've got um, a divorcing couple and you've got a residential property portfolio, the, own, the, the, the main home is a little bit more complicated, but often, and I do see this a lot because I do a lot of expert witness for um, businesses and um, a lot of entrepreneurs own residential properties in divorces. Um, if they transferred the residential property outside of the year of separation, the, the capital gains tax is due. Now, the transfer can be forced by the court. So it's it's not a payment, it's a cash-free transfer and you still have the capital gain. Yeah. So just so when you say separation, do you mean the date that they split up or the divorce was finalized or no, what do you the mean? Date by of that? Separation is the date on which they are no longer living together as husband and wife. Right? Okay. Um that can be that is generally demarked by the fact that one of them leaves the marital home. But confusingly, right, because divorce brings out the worst in most people, <laughs> it can be, if you are able to demonstrate that you led completely separate lives within the marital home and were not living together, husband and wife, it can be that date, right? So the, the capital gains exemption, which people are probably aware of about transfers between husband and wife, only applies when they are living together as husband and wife. Okay. Right. If not, then now, now the change that's coming in, and this may be, this is kind of a useful piece of knowledge from April 23, the separate, the, the transfer can now occur tax free up to the date of dissolution of the marriage. Right. So it gives you a lot more planning opportunities to be able to move the assets around without incurring tax charges. That's a significant change then really, because huge. ultimately- It really is huge. It, it will make, it should make things a lot simpler, um, but people in those circumstances should seek advice because what you'll find after that maybe is people going back afterwards to change the financial settlement, have lost that benefit. So they want to get the refers in order definitely before the, the decree absolute kicks in. Right. So basically they need to make sure they're not going to argue afterwards. Otherwise it may call the cause and tax implications, but that's, yeah, yeah. that's an interesting change that. And I wouldn't have, I, I'm surprised they've 
took a stance and changed it to that because in theory, then they'll be losing out on a fair bit of income. There's a lot, there's a move, there's a much bigger move at the moment to move to no-fault divorces. So they realise that divorce happens and the dissolution of assets can, or the distribution of assets in those circumstances can lead to significant financial hardship, particularly where, where the tax is involved. Okay, interesting. But I mean, that 12-month period is certainly not a long period of time because if you look at it's, the current market... In the 12-month period, if you decide to move out on the 1st of April, you've got five days. <laughs> so it's within the tax year of separation. Jesus. Yeah. So hang on in there for another week if you can. Yeah, well, <laughs> if it's safe to do so. If it's yes. safe to do so. No, that's brilliant. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. We've had a, another live question come in. Yeah. Um, I'm not 100% clear on it. So it says, what expenses can clients declare as rental income? Um, and it says repayment monthly payments can be added it is an expense right okay so that depends on the theory basis it depends on whether you are a sole trader operating outside of a company or you are within a company the tests are similar but not the same right so if you are a sole trader you can deduct all costs that are wholly exclusively and necessary for your business, right? Mm -hmm. So that will include, for example, you can deduct your management fees. You can deduct repair costs. You can deduct, subject to the interest restriction, an element of the interest on your mortgage, right? You cannot, and a lot of people make this mistake, you cannot deduct the capital element of any repayment, right? Yeah. Um, if you make telephone calls, you can deduct part of those costs. If you um, operate through a computer, you can deduct part of those costs. All costs that are wholly exclusively and necessary for your business. If you operate through a company, necessary is removed, right? So it has to be costs wholly and exclusively incurred for your business but you can be a little bit frivolous. <laughs> yeah, like, you, what about that juicy on the Friday night? Do you need that yes. um, to keep you going to, to <laughs> weed the garden the next day? Yeah. Uh, but no, I, I, hopefully that answers your question. If not, um, let us know. But thank you for that. I had another question come in. Um, I suppose it's for, for, well, it is for me. It's not for you, but you'd like to chip in. But when do we see more fixed rates being introduced to the market? Now, I think it's finger in the air sort of stuff at the moment for, for lenders in terms of when products are going to come back and certainly what they're going to come back at. Obviously, more and more lenders have been coming back to the market over the past um, 10 days with their fixed rate products. There's some interesting products out there at the moment. There's a lender that's just launched a one-year fixed rate product, which obviously buys the client a bit of time. But I think, again, flipping it back and its head back to 2008, I know I keep going back there. Um, I mean, I wasn't advising them myself, but obviously I certainly knew about the industry and we've got to start looking, I believe, at things like discount rate mortgages, tracker rate mortgages and variable rates, because um, these are what a lot of people are now looking to do. Certainly if they've got no tie-ins or a short tie-in period, if you look at the difference between current discount rates versus current fixed rates, even if interest rates do rise again, um, or when, when the base rate does rise again, then how much is that going to impact that discounted rate or the tracker rate product versus where the current fixed rates are at? So we're seeing more and more people move across to um, these variable fix, sorry, these variable discount and tracker rate mortgages at the moment. And even so, if you are looking at the average time to complete a deal at the moment in the current marketplace, you're looking at 156 days, which is obviously phenomenal compared to what it used to be like. Um, so even if you're looking at applying for that, and then that lender comes out with a fixed rate product that's more appealing so to speak then you could potentially look to to switch it and go ahead with that fixed rate option but i think now we need to start looking at these sort of discount tracker and variable rates also what we're seeing as well which i'll quickly touch on um certainly from a, a buy to let point of view is people looking at doing bridging so taking bridging finance 
putting it on that 12 month term at the 70, 75% LTV and then assessing the market and looking at where the market moves in the next three to six months and then making a decision about what they're wanting to do um, on a term loan basis. So I think our old way of thinking, yes, um, clients do want security and stability, but we don't have a crystal ball to see where the, the rates are going to end up ultimately. So again, it's down to our own guidance and experience. And certainly for those of you that have been on, um, sorry, that are on this webinar, <clears throat> that have been advisors through the last um, crash, as much as this isn't going to be a crash and recession as such, you'll understand the way the market turned um, and what clients were looking to do back then. So that may mirror what's happening with current client appetite. Um, so I think, again, fixed rates, they are going to come back. It all depends on lenders' SLAs, where current lenders are pricing, pricing themselves because we're seeing lenders currently price themselves out the market. They've also reduced and removed their product offering purely because they've been inundated. So it's not just a case of where the swaps market is and where rates are going. It's a fact that, one, they're comparing themselves and pricing themselves in comparison with the other lenders. They don't want to be too cheap. They don't want to be too expensive. So everyone's waiting for the first lenders to come back to the market. But I think the most important thing is SLAs. A lot of lenders have pulled the products, certainly the fixed rate ones, which are, have been the um, most taken just because they can't keep up with the demand. You'll, you'll see it from Nationwide a few weeks ago when they were doing some really good deals, they priced themselves out of the market um, or increased the rates because the rest of theirs were getting too bad in terms of what they wanted. But because they did that, then a lot of other lenders thought, well, we're getting inundated now, so they put their rates up. So I think it's a bit of a game of cat and mouse at the moment in terms of rate versus SLAs. So I think we will still see quite a few changes um, over the coming weeks and months. But these trackers and discount rates are available and they are really good at the moment. So it depends on your client's appetite, where you see the market going, and I suppose your, your advice really. So there's still plenty of rates out there, but even bridging, bridging is certainly an option. Right, okay. Um, next question. So what have we got? Right, John, this one's, I suppose it's one for both of us really. Um, so with the current EP, well, current pending EPC changes, as much yep. as it's, um, it's still a little way off yet, it's, it's going to come around the corner. The change in interest rates, so obviously rising interest rates, reduced income, cost of getting a, a proper e, EPC ready. Do you think, again, we'll see a substantial increase in um, landlords offloading properties? Um, What's your view on that? Do you think my that... My view on that is, if I'm looking at it from a purely a tax point of view, there's not a lot in the way of incentives for getting properties ready for um, an EPC point of view. Um, the, the, the expenditure you incur is added to the capital value of the property. You only get the tax relief for that when you sell the property. Yeah, there's, there's, there's nothing come through at the moment about whether landlords will be able to expense any of those costs. Um, Landlords generally, on, on, and we're talking residential properties here, landlords can't, as a rule, claim capital allowances, which is like relief for uh, capital expenditure as, as you go along. Um, that being the case, if you're a landlord with a large amount of cost to incur to bring a older property up to being EPC compliant, without tax relief, I can see that it would force a number of landlords actually, yes, to exit those properties. Mm. And with that, most likely be your, your kind of hobby landlords, won't you? You'd assume with your maybe one, two, three properties, but it's more of a, a hobby than a, a business, so to speak. Uh, it, depends, really. it depends. It depends. I mean, a landlord, a landlord who runs a business is obviously going to make a decision as to which of his assets are giving him the best return. And you might have a long-standing Victorian house that is given a great return at the moment because people like Victorian houses and like the features and that kind of thing. But then all of a sudden, if you've got to spend 10, 20 grand on bringing it up and the rest, and I think Roger when he was around mentioned the fact that actually, you know, you might have to remove kitchens and bathrooms, which then gets very expensive. Mm. Um, they, they may sell on those assets. That's it. But, they would stay in business. It might replace them with other kinds of assets, which they uh, have to spend less money on, get a similar return on. 
but then obviously with that, you've got the issues of the capital gains, haven't you? When you're off absolutely do. You absolutely do. So yeah, sale of an asset um, is basically, you know, your, your proceeds less the cost you've incurred in uh, buying that asset and, and the capital value you, you, you spend on it as it goes along. So yeah, there's a, I mean, still 28% capital gains. That hasn't changed in any budget anywhere. The, the government is, uh, whilst they're trying to, well, pushing out um, the, the growth, um, they're, they're certainly not aiming that at landlords particularly. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And this is one that, that's came in as well, but <laughs> it's, a, it, it's always an interesting one, but client owns a property in individual names. Um, they're moving it across to a limited company. Yeah. No lending on the mortgage and the solicitor, because they know best, and you know what I'm going to say here, has recommended the client transfers that across with a nil value or a substantially lower value than yeah. what the property is worth. What implications will that have? And give us some time scales as well, because I know there's some time scales on this. So what, what do the risks have with that? And why is that an absolute no-no? Right. So um, I see this a lot still. Uh, I've been doing this for years, but you, you get people who's kind of like, it's either gift into the company or gift to a family member yeah, of a property. And it's kind of like, but we only transferred it for a pound or we, we gifted it and it doesn't matter. Um, there's, there is a rule within the tax legislation that says where you transfer an asset you own that would be subject to capital gains tax to a connected party, that transfer is deemed to be at market value for tax. So it doesn't matter what the actual commercial transaction was. The transfer for tax purposes is at market value. Now, if you've given it, you pay the capital gains tax, regardless of whether you've received the money for it or not. If you transfer it to a company you own, you pay the capital gains tax based on the market value of that property, not the amount of consideration given. So it can give rise to sizable, sizable capital gains tax charges without having the cash available to pay it. So no, it doesn't work at all, no. Basically, whatever you put on that form, that piece of paper, that transfer, whatever, it's irrelevant. I've got a deal at the moment. Right. And they are quite concerned. It's, it's a little bit flipped around the other way, but to, but to say what it is, um, for a variety of reasons, I got a client who purchased a commercial property, right? And they had to go through an intermediary because there needed to be a bit of anonymity between the seller and the ultimate purchaser. So a chap acted in the middle, right? My buyer funded the purchase through a loan to the middle company. Okay. And the middle company bought the property for its market value, right? Mm -hmm. They then sold on the property for a pound <laughs> and settlement of the debt, right? Yeah. The client is concerned that, and this is a slight tangent to what I was just saying, the client is concerned they will only be able to deal with the pound. Okay. Yeah. No settlement of the debt is also consideration. So it's a deemed market value transaction. Yeah. So that, even if it's recorded at the land registry at a pound, yeah, the transaction is what the substance of the transaction is for tax purposes. Doesn't matter what the legal form says. Okay. In those circumstances. Amazing. <laughs> there you go. And again, as I say on these on these webinars, that's why John um, is so useful, and he's the only person that I would trust and recommend within the industry. As I've always said, we don't get any kickbacks. We don't have a we don't have a business relationship, so to speak. Um, but he's the only person that I'd have on these webinars that I believe, and hopefully he's telling the truth um, in terms of his knowledge and experience, because he is certainly one of the best within his sector. So if anyone's looking to link up with a tax advisor, I definitely recommend John. Um, or anyone else that I've met in the industry. So there's a bit of a shameless plug there, John. I'd be upset if you recommended somebody else while I'm here, fella. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've had a residency now for two years, haven't you? So you're obviously um, earning your keep and proving your net worth. So no, thank you for that. And it just goes to show that regardless what solicitors say um, on a form, 
uh, you shouldn't be trusting these people who aren't suitably qualified. And the ones that are suitably qualified, that John's just mentioned there, in terms of that transaction, it will always come back to bite you in the bum, regardless of that, because, well, HMRC won't be cheated. The other thing to remember is, as well as if you are transferring um, or selling a property for a pound um, to a limited company, and then you're looking to refinance that, never in a million years will a lender step near it because of obviously the reasons behind the transfer at that value, the tax avoidance essentially, and the majority of lenders in the marketplace will just completely keep away from it because they know what the clients are doing or are trying to do. So you'll struggle to get finance on that. It's similar to the six month rule when you buy a property, um, can't refinance within six months or certainly can't refinance to one of these mainstream better lenders. So it's something to bear in mind if clients are trying to be tax clever when they're spoken to a solicitor, they think they know the, they think they know the right thing. Well, actually, it could be a hindrance and it could be very costly for them a couple of weeks, months down the line. So it's something to bear in mind. John, other questions came in for you. Bear in mind, you've got 10 minutes left, guys. So if you do have any questions, please do answer them. Um, but John, another question came in for you. So a client owned a property with his wife and two children. And from two weeks ago, she left him with the children and living in rent now. Um, with, with him still in the house and wants to remove her from the contract. What are his options? I understand that she wants £36,000 from the property. Um, can she claim anything in the future? And what about the children? Okay, that is mainly a legal question, but I've done, um, as I say, a fair amount of expert witness and seen similar situations to this previously, right? So... In a divorce, basically what happens is both parties' assets get listed on a form and they are up for grabs in terms of value, right? So if she is on the deeds of the house um, as either a joint tenant or a tenant in common, legally as a joint tenant, she's, a, she's, not, she's, a, she's got an interest in the whole of the house equal to 50% of the value, right? As a tenant in common, she might have a defined interest in the house. Regardless of that, the courts will look to see what assets were um, accumulated during the course of the marriage, and then they will divide them based on what they believe to be a fair and equitable split. Okay? So if she's moved out, um, the courts could force a sale of the house. The courts could force him to pay her value out of the house. Um, I don't believe, it's a legal question, I don't believe he's got much in the way of options of being able to remove her from the contract if she's on it. Um, in fact, to be fair, I, I don't think that's going to happen at all. Um, she would only be able to claim in the future if she can demonstrate there wasn't full disclosure of your chap's assets, or there was a material change in circumstances, your, your guy would be best advised to um, see a family solicitor. Um, and the family courts will always, in some way, shape, or form, make provision for the children. Perfect. Perfect. That was a, that was a different type of question. So thank you very much for that. Roy, you have noticed you haven't answered, you haven't asked any questions today. Um, you must be missing Rog. <laughs> right, okay, so we've got a couple of minutes left um, for any more live ones, otherwise we'll start wrapping this up. But yeah, again, shameless plug about our business, but again, if you've got any cases that you are struggling with or you're getting questions in sectors that you're not currently active in, so it could be commercial and things like that, um, which is not something you've done previously. Remember, with Crystal being a package here, we're... We're in the trenches with you. We're here to help you, here to educate you, and here to, to help you earn some more money and create more opportunities for your business. So as I mentioned at the very beginning, we're in the trenches. We are really in the trenches. And ultimately, we're going through a very interesting time. Um, we're busier than ever at the moment with new new advisors or, or new sorts of cases from, from different um, sources, so to speak. And I think a lot of people are now thinking where they're going to get the next meal from. The vanilla market does seem to be quieting down. And ultimately, if, if you're getting quieter in a particular area of your business and you're looking to, to want to do more, then pick up the phone ourselves. We'll educate you around commercial, development, anything ultimately you want to get involved in. 
And even if your business doesn't currently offer, say, your non-regulated bridging, your, your foreign national buy-to-lets and your, your commercial stuff, you could potentially look to start advertising for stuff like that for your um, business owners that you're doing residentials for and simply referring these sorts of deals to Crystal. We pick up the advice of the client, dealing with it from inquiry the right way through to completion. And should that deal complete, then you're going to get 50% of the proc um, purely for that referral. So it's kind of working smarter, not harder. And again, it's the conversations that I have with the majority of my accounts. If it's something you've not done previously, something you're not interested in doing, don't have the knowledge and skills to do, or just simply can't be bothered to do it, but you're getting them sorts of inquiries, refer it across to Crystal, use and abuse us in the way that you want. As much as we do get exclusive and semi-exclusive rates with a lot of our lenders and have access to certain funding lines, they're not our products and the clients aren't our clients. All we've got is service. So as much as we sit on these webinars and educate and go to relevant roadshows and, and meetings and such, all we've got is that service element. So if you have something that you want us to provide a service on, then ultimately let us know. Um, and we're more than happy to educate or simply take over that deal for you. And then you reap the benefits should that deal complete. But ultimately, there's no risk to your business. It protects your business because we do all the compliance and um, advice on them cases. So it's something to bear in mind. And again, my phone's always on to so pick up the phone to me or a member of my team. But look how we can help you earn more, create new opportunities for you. But more importantly, diversify your income streams and start fishing in ponds that you may have previously not wanted to fish in because of the market and sector experience that you have or actually don't have. And I think we'll wrap it up, John, unless there's any any questions. So um, I think it's been an interesting one today. There's certainly been a lot of changes. I think when we come back in December, obviously with Rog back, we'll get him dressed up as Santa Claus, um, have a bit of fun around it, but we'll wrap it up for the year. And I, I imagine in two months, a lot will change within the market. Um, we're not going to guess what it's going to be, but I imagine there's going to be a lot to cover off. But yeah, um, I'll let you say your thank yous and buys, and I'll wrap it up completely. But thank you very much for joining me. Again, it's been amazing um, as always, and there's certainly a lots of little nuggets that um, I've certainly got from it. And I imagine the audience has to thank you. No, no worries. It's um, as you say, a lot of change coming, and um, when change happens, the implications on your tax position. Um, change um, and that may mean that a lot of people now need to start considering some different type of planning um, change always causes an uptake in the kind of work I do um, and it would be worth people out there just having those conversations with their clients um, to see how they are fair and, and if they do need to look at different structures or a bit of planning um, find out their options basically to see what they can do so no thank you again always a pleasure no, thank you. That that makes perfect sense. Again, similar to a football team, you've got a you've got strikers, midfielders, defenders, goalkeepers, coaches, you name it. So having good people around you who are knowledgeable and experienced within their sectors and actually stay in their lanes, um, it's more invaluable than anything. And it's having that framework and support. So thank you very much for everybody joining. Hopefully you found it useful. Again, any questions, reach out to myself after this or my team. Um, as always, we will share part of John's information and contact details so you can get in touch should you need to. Use and abuse my team, myself. We're here to support you. Hopefully join us in December. Our marketing team will be sending out information of that afterwards and hope everyone has a great day and let's keep firefighting. Thank you very much. Cheers, John. You know. Have a great day. Bye.